there. I'm Amira David. This is Boombas, and these are the stories we are tracking for you today. U.S. stocks plunge on weak Chinese manufacturing data. Plus, Brazil temporarily blocks 100 million of its residents from using the popular service WhatsApp. I'll tell you what that's all about coming right up. And then we're talking to Kate Long about Puerto Rico's latest default as it grapples with an economic crisis. What does that mean for the broader municipal bond market? That's straight ahead. And in today's Big Deal, Ed Harris and I are breaking down Warren Buffett's rant against Wall Street. He says investment consultants are giving bad advice while making all this money along the way. Does he have a point? We'll tackle that and a whole lot more on today's show. Don't go anywhere. Boom Bust starts right now. U.S. stocks took a huge tumble Tuesday with the Dow Jones Industrial Average falling more than 150 points in morning trade. Analysts say the markets were rattled after a private survey of Chinese manufacturing showed an unexpected decline, thereby stoking fears over the country's weakening economy. This particular manufacturing index, which focuses on smaller and medium-sized enterprises, fell to 49.4 in April from 49 Point seven in March. Keep in mind, a reading above 50 indicates expansion. Below 50 indicates a contraction. But it's not a loss in manufacturing across the board. Over the weekend, we learned that the official manufacturing index in China, which targets larger companies, had its second month of expansion. So analysts today are cautioning over a very mixed picture forming here. One survey tells us China is slowly regaining its footing, while the other suggests the economy is still in the process of bottoming out. Which story is it? Of course, we don't know that yet. All right, and moving right along here to a big technology halt in Brazil. A judge has ordered a temporary block of user access to the popular text messaging service WhatsApp now owned by Facebook. The move affects 100 million Brazilian users of the app and it's expected to last 72 hours. This is all allegedly due to the company's failure to turn over data in an ongoing drug trafficking investigation. Sadly, this is not the first time the Brazilian government has moved to block the app. Last December, the service was blocked for 48 hours after WhatsApp failed to report uh, respond to a court order in a criminal investigation. Now, in response to the latest move, the company's CEO and co-founder had this to say. He said, yet again, millions of innocent Brazilians are being punished because a court wants WhatsApp to turn over information we repeatedly said we do not have. When you send an end-to-end -end encrypted message, no one else can read it, not even us. WhatsApp says it's disappointed this has happened for a second time in five months, and it's working to get the app back up and running as soon as possible. Well, despite the fact that Turkey has not met all the conditions in a controversial deal with the EU to curb the influx of refugees, the European Commission is still upholding its end of the bargain. Boombas Bianca Faschini has the details. Pretty soon, it looks like Turkish citizens will obtain the right to visa-free travel throughout the European Union. On Wednesday, the European Commission is expected to invite EU leaders to vote on the matter, which would apply to short-term visas for leisure and business. It will not, however, grant them the opportunity to get work visas. The announcement came one day after Turkey established visa-free travel for all citizens of the EU. And this is all part of the deal that the EU made with Turkey months ago. They promised visa liberalization for the citizens in exchange for taking some refugees off their hands. And recently, Turkey threatened to stop taking them in if the EU didn't live up to that promise. But there's been plenty of criticism due to Turkey's poor reputation for freedom of speech judicial representation, and minority rights, just to name a few. On the other hand, members of the commission have praised Turkey's overall handling of the crisis. In a March report, they noted that Turkey has offered hospitality and assistance 
to over 2.5 million Syrian refugees. They also highlighted access to the labor market, which is expected to, quote, facilitate their social inclusion and self-reliance. Regardless of where you stand on the issue, it is true that the number of refugees in Europe is falling. But it's still too early to tell what changes visa liberalization could bring. All right, Puerto Rico's debt crisis has deepened after defaulting on most of its $422 million debt payment. The governor of the island has argued that he was faced with no other option. Either he could pay out bondholders or he could pay city workers in order to keep essential services running. But is it really that black and white, or were there more choices for the governor at hand? I tossed that question to Kate Long, a partner at Puerto Rico Clearinghouse. Take a listen to what she had to say. Right, Amir, so the Government Development Bank, which is the debt that was defaulted on, um, on May 1, is actually a separate legal corporation from the central government of Puerto Rico. It, its uh, money is separate from the central government money that pays workers like police and education um, and health care expenses. So it's a little bit of a, you know, a twist that he's got there. He's, uh, the governor is trying to create this urgency um, to force Congress to act. And you know, I think you'll continue to see um, you know, statements from the governor that kind of create this kind of panic situation to get Congress to move on this legislation that's pending there. Sure. Yeah. And Puerto Rico is now blaming U.S. lawmakers. We know that um, the U.S., of course, is involved here, the Congress, for its failure to help them restructure. Uh, but, of course, we know Puerto Rico, too, has played a role in the economic distress. How do you parse out the blame? What really should be the role of the U.S. here? Right. So overall, the uh, federal government sends about $25 billion a year in direct grants and transfer payments to the Puerto Rico, which is about a third of the gross national product of Puerto Rico. So there's this massive level of support. In terms of debt restructuring, Puerto Rico started out two years ago with just the intent to restructure the electric utility debt and some of the public corporation debt. And over that two years, it's morphed where they've stated they need to restructure all the debt of the island. So. It was basically last July when the governor said that um, all the debt was unpayable, and he's paid about $4 billion of that debt so far, paid it down. Um, and now, really, they are out of cash because he took all the liquid resources of the government and made those debt payments. And Congress has been working basically since December to create a framework uh, specifically for Puerto Rico to address its debt problems. But what role do you think the U.S. should play? I mean, to what extent should they be helping them get out of this mess? Right. So the other part of the legislation, which is really almost more important than debt restructuring, is a control board, which will be a seven-member board appointed by the president with names that come from members of the leaders in Congress. We'll give him some lists of names that he'll make these appointments from. The control board will work with the legislature and the governor to get the balance, uh, the budget actually balanced in Puerto Rico, which it hasn't been in eight or nine years. Uh, rationalize the government and figure out really how much debt can be paid and then they can start working with the bondholders by each class of debt to restructure the debt if need be. Are there specific places you can point to in terms of where Puerto Rico should be working on greater efficiencies? I've heard a lot of, of critiques about uh, the government working more efficiently. For example, I've read a lot about tax collection being an issue. Uh, what do you know about that? Right, exactly, Amir. So Puerto Rico is uh, estimated to collect about, you know, 50 percent or high 40s percent of available tax revenues. Um, and in the mainland U.S., it's a little bit closer to 70 percent. So you can see there's a gap sort of um, just in terms of how they collect taxes. The tax code there is also highly regressive. Most of the tax burden falls on the low and middle income tax um, brackets. They basically barely tax the elite in Puerto Rico. And overall, they collect about 10% um, of the GDP in taxes. And in the mainland, that's about 24%. So you can see overall, the tax burden is relatively light, even though it's a low, lower income place than the mainland. Sure. And the big question here, of course, is how big of an impact all of this will have on the municipal uh, bond market overall. I'd imagine most broad bond funds have sold off their stakes in Puerto Rico. So. Would you say that the, the damage for Americans is limited at this point? I, I mean, most people in the municipal bond market believe that, that the, uh, you know, the ill effects have already happened because Puerto Rico has been in this spiral for several years. Um, 
So we've all just been kind of anxious for this, you know, these events to start happening, these defaults. Outside of people, professionals in the municipal market, some of this will come as a surprise. Honestly, many Americans are not aware of Puerto Rico or the fact that there's Americans, you know, that the Puerto Rican people are American. Um, I get that a lot, where there's just not a general understanding of what Puerto Rico is as a territory. But I think overall, most of this news has been kind of priced into the securities and you know, the market, the municipal market is, you know, ready for all this to happen. Right. They've priced it in. Uh, the debt crisis in Puerto Rico has been highly politicized, I've noticed, uh, given that it's an election year. And we're seeing ads on TV uh, that are just sort of incredible to me from a group of, uh, of people that are sort of painting this potential plan uh, that Paul Ryan is pushing forward as a bailout. But just to be clear, is this a bailout? No, there's no tax dollars involved um, in this plan. I mean, I kind of turn it around. I see Congress is already sending $25 billion a year down there, and it's way past time that Congress start creating some kind of oversight on that money and making sure it's spent well and the people of Puerto Rico are getting the right services and you know the right kind of care, health care, whatever that they need. So, no, it's just the opposite. It's the same amount of money that they've always received, but more oversight to make sure it's being spent well. But at some point, if nothing is done, then taxpayers are on the hook, right? No, I, that's also a myth. I mean, if they default on this debt, um, then various classes of bondholders have different types of rights to go to court um, and to sue for it. But I don't see Congress, a Republican Congress, ever increasing beyond this $25 billion a year, um, unless it's the, in specifically in the area of health care, which is, I think, an area that Congress could do a little better for for Puerto Rico. But the idea that Republicans would put more money on the table for Puerto Rico, I think, is false. When you say health care, are you referring to uh, Zika and, and treatments for Zika, et cetera? That and also this uh, parity on Medicaid and Medicare, um, because Puerto Rico is a territory and not a state, it has a different funding formula for those programs. And they do receive much less money um, than, say, even Mississippi, who's another poor state. Um, and that is something over time, when Congress addresses Obamacare, that they will probably, um, you know, create some kind of more equal parity for Puerto Rico or give some support. It's just they don't want to carve it out now. They don't really want to open the Obamacare issue right now to address Puerto Rico's health care issue. Right. And this July, and you alluded to this, I mean, Puerto Rico does have another bill to contend with, $1.9 billion. And unlike the bonds that uh, Puerto Rico failed uh, to, to pay off this week, in July we're talking about payments on general obligation bonds. How exactly are these bonds different? What does it mean if they can't be paid? So gen uh, the general obligation debt is constitutionally guaranteed in, in Puerto Rico um, and has the highest level of seniority or guarantee. Um, there's different opinions among you know, analysts, credit analysts, whether they have sufficient liquidity to pay for that general obligation debt on July 1. Then there's also other many classes of debt that are due that day. There's also a fair amount of money tucked away into debt reserve funds um, in various places that could be, you know, technically be drawn out to make that general uh, obligation debt service payment. All right, time for a quick break, but stick around because when we return, Congressman Ron Paul is on the show. He'll weigh in on the debate between privacy and security when it comes to user encryption. Then in today's big deal, Ed Harrison and I are breaking down Warren Buffett's rant against investment brokers. We'll tell you why he says they are just flat out overpaid. That's on the other side. Stay with us. And as we go to break, here are the numbers at the closing bell. What did you have for breakfast yesterday? Why would you pick those shoes? How fast is your Wi-Fi? What's your dog's name? Why'd you name him that? What's your biggest fear in life? Ever been on a hayride? When's the last time you read a book? What would you say if you ever met the Pope? Oh Who's the best quarterback of all time? What's one topping that doesn't belong on a pizza? Now, I've interviewed you too. Ah. Question more. You're watching an RT America special report. Man, it ain't about him, it's about you, it's about me, it's about everybody. Basically, everything that you think you know about civil society has broken down. 
There's always going to be somebody else one step ahead of the game. We should not be in the business of normalizing violence. We don't need people that think like this on our planet. This is an incredibly tense situation. For decades, the American middle class has been railroaded by Washington politics. Big money corporate interest has drowned out a lot of voices. That's how it is in the news culture in this country now. That's where I come in. I'm Ed Schultz. I do the news on RT America. I'll make sure you don't get railroaded and you'll get the straight talk and the straight news. Question more. Welcome back to the show. If there's one message that Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump has reiterated time and time and time again, it's that the economy is in terrible shape. And to get his thoughts on that, we spoke to Congressman Ron Paul. He's a former presidential candidate, also the host of the Ron Paul Liberty Report. And I first asked him if Trump is right. Here's what he had to say. Oh, yes, you're right. absolutely so. And uh, I've talked to that's what I've talked about for years and years talked about why it would get that way and now it's that way yes constantly but our analysis is 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 different because i abhor tariffs and he loves tariffs i don't think you should uh you know uh, bash our trading partners you should you know work things out and work toward free trade not for saying that uh you you can uh, uh go toward protectionism and solve the problem i mean we do export our jobs there's no doubt but that's a monetary thing when, when you print money the money goes overseas and that's where the cheap products are produced so that's a predictable consequence of the monetary system that we have today dr paul um you've said that if trump is the nominee the gop nominee you will vote third party is there any particular candidate that sticks out for you right now anyone that you might endorse before this election is over you mean <clears throat> outside of a third party or in a republican party outside of the Republican Party, yes. Oh, well, I mean, I'll, I'll look at the Libertarians. I don't think they've picked their candidate, but that's mainly uh, for a conscience sake. Uh, I hate wasting votes. And if you throw a vote away with uh, the current crop, Republicans and Democrats, I don't, I don't think it's worth wasting. I think you should make your vote count. And I think if you're a progressive Democrat, because a true progressive Democrat can't be happy with uh, Bernie Sanders either. You know, he's, he's a lot more militant than people realize. So if you're a true progressive, you probably ought to vote Green Party. If you, mm -hmm. if you care about personal liberty and free markets, you have to vote Libertarian, because right now I don't see anybody in the Republican or Democrat party that could uh, uh, satisfy that group of people. Uh, you know, a lot of people don't know this, but there are multiple candidates running for president on the Libertarian ticket. As you mentioned, we don't know exactly who uh, the, the nominee will be. Uh, but one of them is former antivirus developer John McAfee, and we had the pleasure uh, of talking to him on the show recently. We spoke with him um, specifically about the debate regarding privacy and encryption, the level of cooperation there should be between the government and uh, corporations on security issues. And that, I think, has been a defining uh, civil liberties issue this year. Uh, I want to get your thoughts on that because, um, you know, I, I want to know really to what extent you think companies should be obligated to assist the government in decrypting user communications. Well, I'd use a simple guideline. I'd use the uh, Constitution and, uh, and uh, the Fifth Amendment and uh, the Fourth Amendment. They can't see, they can't take anything without a precise warrant with reasonable cause, but no blanket checks uh, where they just go out and listen to all, look at what the NSA does now. They listen to everything and have everything and they know everything about us, the financial records. That's all wrong. Uh, the government should be open. The people should have their privacy. Today, the people don't have their privacy and the government is secret. So that's uh, that's the, that's the real problem, but no. And if there's a discussion about it, you should always all err on the side of the protection of privacy of the individual. And uh, yet today, it's always security. We have to be safe. The, the, our Constitution was not written to make people safe. Uh, that it sounds good, and a lot of people like that. But safety is something that somebody else provides. 
What the government is to provide for us is, is uh, liberty so that we can take care of ourselves, protect ourselves, protect our families, provide for ourselves uh, economically, but not to make us safe. If you make people safe, then you end up with socialism redistributing wealth and destroying all wealth. And then you end up with others who will say that we're going to make you safe by, uh, you know, telling everybody exactly what they can do. And we know every single thing that you're going to do and there'll be no privacy. I think both of those uh, views are wrong. Yeah, we just heard recently from the FBI, they reiterated that they would not tell Apple uh, about the security flaw. They would not tell them exactly how they were able to hack the uh, iPhone 5C, that's the phone uh, that was at issue uh, in, in the San Bernardino terrorist attack. Uh, I want to get your thoughts on that really briefly. I mean, do you think the government should be obligated to disclose uh, those kinds of security flaws to corporations so that they can be fixed? I mean, in this case, in particular, it's going to leave millions of iPhone users in the U.S. vulnerable. Um, so the question is, do they have an obligation to notify them? Well, pr probably not, but they certainly didn't have an obligation to force you know, Apple to produce it, they'd become a slave then to the government. But if the government is doing something to looking to look for information and not violating the citizens' rights, then I would say that uh, uh, the government can go and do that and wouldn't be obligated immediately to turn the information they had over to another source uh, if, if it has to do with national security. But the whole thing is, is uh, there's way too much secrecy in the government and too little privacy for the American people. Time. I'm sitting here with Ed Harrison, and we are talking about investing. Berkshire Hathaway had its annual meeting in Omaha, Nebraska this past weekend, and according to some, Berkshire's chairman, Warren Buffett, otherwise known as the Oracle of Omaha, went on an epic rant against Wall Street and Wall Street brokers. We've got to talk about that, but before we do, there's an update on the TTIP, the Euro-U.S. trade deal that just came out moments ago, and Ed, I was hoping you you could fill us in on what happened. So what we know is, is basically Francois Hollande has said in its present form we are not going to sign up to this agreement. The EU-US trade deal is basically defunct in its present form. Right. It's not necessarily going to go away, but uh, tomorrow we can talk more and about that. And its sister that. deal to TTP is sort of making its way l through, uh, uh, through Congress, and it is sort of a green light. So it's interesting to see the, the dichotomy there. We will continue to talk about that. Um, now, let's talk about this, this rant, because a Buffett rant, kind of hard to imagine. But what did he have to say? Yeah, actually, two quotes that he made stand out for me that I saw from what the Wall Street Journal was reporting on. Here, let me read to you what they were saying. Uh, the first one is, 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 he said, quote, no consultant in the world is going to tell you just buy an S&P index fund and sit on it for the next 50 years. They come in and talk for hours, and you pay them a large fee, and they always suggest something other than just sitting on your rear end and participating in the American business without cost. And then the second one that he said that I thought was interesting was he said, they say, quote, uh, well, you can only get the best talent by paying two and 20. That's for hedge funds or something of the sort. And then the flow of money from the hyperactive to what I call the helpers is dramatic. There's something funny about hearing a billionaire complain like that. He's trying to act like he's the little man, even though we know he's not. But give me the, the, the shortened version of, of the message he's really, you know, trying to, yeah. to get across here. So basically he's saying that, you know, uh, all Wall Street brokers are just fancy sort of Ivy League educated versions of right. the Jordan Belfort that we saw in the movie, you know, where he was from uh, Oakmont Stratton. Or is it Stratton Oakmont? Uh, and that they're trying to, you know, part you from your money. That they're, that they're they're not actually delivering returns. They're just trying to get into your wallet and 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 you know make transaction fees basically. Yeah. And and not actually do what they should be doing, which is investing in a way that makes you money. Yeah, and this is something that peeves a lot of, of small-time investors out there, for sure. And I know you talked to Howard Lindzen about this, um, and, and he weighed in. We're going to be airing this interview uh, later this week. But what did he have to say about uh, his comments? Yeah, he didn't really buy anything uh, that Buffett had to say. I, I think the, the gist of what Howard's going to say is, is that Buffett is acting sort of like a cranky old guy who is ornery and who's uh, dispensing advice from yesteryear and that essentially 
he is missing out on a lot of uh, potential gains in places like technology where Howard Lindzen is very active. But he's pro-investment brokers. He doesn't think that investment brokers are, are you know, basically making tons of money on the backs of the little guys he doesn't see it that way he was uh, he took the uh, what buffett said and looked at it in terms of active versus non-active investing that was what i was asking him about mm -hmm. cuz buffett is basically saying look you know invest you. in the s&p 500 low and fees coast. and just coast mm -hmm. and howard lindzen was saying no in fact i don't believe that you could do that uh, technology uh, there are lots of different things that you can do, and I think that you know his model is not the right model. Okay, so he's saying don't be passive necessarily. Exactly, yeah. and he also said, by the way, that he doesn't think even investing in an index fund is passive. That when you invest in an index fund, I mean, there are other ways in which to make it non-passive. Oh, good. Uh, just re you know, in terms of when you reinvest and how much money you allocate at various oh, points. Oh, good. So I don't cycle. have to feel like a lazy investor if I choose to go that route. <laughs> good to know. But I'm going to put you on the spot and ask you um, who you tend to, to buy into. Is it Buffett or? or Lindsay. Well, you, to be honest with you, I, I do buy into Buffett a lot, and so, but I think that in this particular fight, they're right uh, in, in on both sides. There are things that are good on both sides. That Buffett, you know, he's really all about having a measure of safety and security. What he's saying basically is, if you feel comfortable with the investments that you're making then that's good and so you should invest based upon that mm. but most people aren't sophisticated enough to right. actually do the, the work and they should just go with the index fund what Lindzen is saying is that B B B Buffett is basically avoiding a whole class of stocks technology which are increasingly important in today's world and in tomorrow's world are going to be even more important and as a result of that he's missing out on returns as an example Buffett is only investing in IBM in the technology space and everyone knows that IBM is not one of the stellar performers in that space so he's missing out on a whole host of different companies that potentially could be rewarding to his portfolio really quickly how do active managers do they don't do well at all mm -hmm. I mean you we, we talked about this in March specifically with regard to Europe let me just uh, give you a quote here from the Financial Times almost every actively managed equity fund in Europe investing in global emerging and US markets has failed to beat its benchmark over the past decade I mean I'll just stop right there because that says it all yeah, that's they, it they're, they're not doing as well as they could. All right, we'll leave it right there. Ed Harrison, thank you so much for that. We love hearing from you guys. Tweet at all of us, Edward NH, Bianca Vashini, Amira David. And remember, you can see all the segments featured in today's show on YouTube, youtube.com slash RT. From all of us here at Boombus, thanks for watching, guys. We'll see you next time.